sound great. <laughs> Here come the audiences. Lovely to see some faces popping up into the room. Can we unmute people and just say hi or they have oh, to be no, muted? Be All right. Well, maybe just some waves then. <laughs> they, can, they can say where they're at in the chat. Oh, please do. Please chuck the a hello and where you're from in the chat just so that we can have at least some semblance of a feeling of all being together in one place. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing some lovely faces of people in various states of relaxation, at home, which is lovely. I can see some lovely soft toys in someone's room. This is the chat. All right, I'm going to come over and introduce you. Great. It's solo tech for high tech, isn't it? Hello, everybody. Um, we're sharing one computer here. Um, so I will, um, I can actually see that people are waiting to be admitted. So I'm admitting them as I talk. Um, so welcome to Avid Reader Bookshop. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in this area, the Yagara and the Turrbal people. And I'd like to pay my deepest respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge that because we are on, um, because we're on Zoom, we are zooming out onto the lands of many different Aboriginal people. And um, I'd like to say that this is Aboriginal land. It always was, always will be, and sovereignty was never ceded. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders wherever you might be as well. Uh, on that note, a um, couple of housekeeping things for everybody. I have put a message in the chat and I'm getting lots of chats coming in about where people are dialing in from. Um, so I think that's really lovely to see where you're all from. Um, and um, please feel free to comment, um, add questions at any point in time, because um, what we're going to do is we're going to use this chat area um, for questions at the end. And it does look like you can actually see the questions come through. So um, Tegan will be able to take your questions because um, they're coming through to Tegan, which is great. Um, so without further ado, you'll all be on silent for um, the event tonight, but of course, use that chat, chat function for questions. Um, there will be people joining us along the way. If you drop out, I will very, very quickly let you back in again. Um, very exciting to be hosting this event because um, Lucia did um, her last book launch here in the flesh, in person, and it was really wonderful um, to have her and such a great writer that she is um, come into the shop um, and I'm really, really happy that we can have her here in some way, even though she is still in London and not able to be here in Australia with us, which was our original plan. But um, plans go awry in a pandemic, as we have found out. So it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce you to Tegan Taylor, who is a health and science journalist in the ABC Science Unit. You can hear her daily on the ever popular Coronacast or on ABC's RN Health Report, which she has run straight from tonight. So I missed it tonight. I normally listen to your voice on the health report, but um, I always catch up on Coronacast. I am a regular, regular listener. And so I'm a little bit starstruck to have Tegan Taylor in the shop tonight speaking to you. I will pass over to Tegan. Thanks, Chrissy. Hello, everyone. Um, echoing that acknowledgement of country and respect for elders past, present and emerging wherever you're joining us from tonight. And I'm delighted to in turn introduce the guest of honour, which is, of course, uh, Lucia Osborne Crowley, a journalist, essayist, writer and legal researcher. Her news reporting has appeared in ABC News, The Guardian, Huffington Post, The Wall Street Journal, The Women's Agenda. I'm not at all intimidated. Her long form writing has appeared in Lifted Brow and Mianjin. And of course, she is the author of My Body Keeps Your Secrets, which we are here to talk about tonight. Uh, Lucia, I was scared of how your book was going to make me feel, but when I sat down, I devoured it in one evening. So for those of you who have joined us tonight, if you've read the book, you'll know that Lucia's writing is beautiful. And if you have not, then you're in for a treat because we're going to open tonight's uh, event with a reading from Lucia herself. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to be with you. Um, as Chrissy said, I wish 
I was with you in person, um, but thank you for joining us anyway. I'm so sorry that so many of you are in lockdown and that we all had to join each other in, in this very strange world that we now live in. Um, but thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Tegan, um, for having me. Um, and I also wanted to echo the acknowledgement of country um, and acknowledge the elders of all the lands that we're zooming out to and um, also acknowledge that this, all of these lands always were and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I also wanted to say before I start reading, um, this reading as well as this conversation will touch on trauma and sexual violence. Um, so I just wanted to give you that warning um, if, if those are things that, that might upset you, just so you know. So I'm gonna do a little reading from the beginning of the book just to um, set the tone a little bit. So this book follows on from my first book, which was about um, a sexual assault, uh, something that happened to me when I was 15 and then I stayed quiet about for 10 years. Um, so that's just to give some context for this, uh, for this reading. I thought I had mastered the art of anti-concealment. I thought that by writing that book, I had vanquished my need to be invulnerable. I thought I had escaped loneliness by allowing myself to be seen, but I hadn't. I was still ashamed. It was the everyday insidious shame that hurt me the most. The bodily shame that creeps into friendships and work and relationships and exercise. The kind that has both nothing and everything to do with my rape. The kind that I share with women and non-binary people all over the world who have and have not had experiences like mine. Their everyday shame also has nothing and everything to do with their rape and mine. Shame and violation is a long running war and the everyday scars are their foot soldiers. I spent 12 years thinking almost exclusively about my body. It was the only thing on my mind. As a semi-professional gymnast, I would be constantly appraising its power, its strength, what it needed from me, what it was asking for. Stretches, an ice bath, maybe some extra press ups to prime me for a competition. Then I spent 10 years not thinking about my body at all. Because I had, I had not told anyone about my rape, I had no way of understanding the acute dissociation I started experiencing in its aftermath. All of a sudden, my body felt so far away. It was a crime scene and I wanted to run from it and never look back. I started to ignore it, its sensations, its desires. But the thing about living in a human body is that you cannot transcend it, no matter how hard you try. It is with you every day, every minute. You cannot leave it behind. You cannot change what it has seen and experienced. You just have to find a way to live with it. I know that now. I have always been a perfectionist and a desperate overachiever. I thought I could challenge my mind to erase my assault and carry on as normal, in the same way I could challenge it to learn my English essays off by heart. But I was wrong. As I was deciding whether to disclose my assault, I read a book by the psychiatrist Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score. It is all about how the body remembers what the mind has suppressed, about how the body will carry scars of our experiences forever, no matter how badly we want to erase them. That phrase just kept ringing in my ears for weeks. The body keeps the score. The body keeps the score. As soon as I read that phrase, I knew it was true. When I started this book, I thought I was writing about personal stories. And I was, but I was also writing about something much bigger. What came out of my reporting for this book was the story of countless systems of structural oppression each of which enacts their worst consequences on the body we are forced to keep, the body we have to continue living in through every nightmare. What came out was a story of structural discrimination, a scourge for which the blame is conveniently spread among the amorphous group, dispelled as responsibility spreads, but for which the costs are felt in one body by each individual heart. When we see this clearly, we can ask ourselves, what does that do to a person? to a life, to each pound of flesh. These stories are all different, but their impact is the same. It's about the way we carry this impact with us. It's about, it's about the way we are taught to be ashamed of our own oppression. It's about gaslighting on the grandest scale. It's about feeling unable to speak the truth. It is in a single word about shame. 
Shame is the emotion that compels us to keep secrets. It comes from the outside, but lives within. It is a very complicated demon. I love that passage because it sums up so many of the themes that you then go on to explore in the book and we'll touch on them tonight. But I wanted to start, Lucia, by you really, really put yourself out there with your first book and now with this one and writing about your rape and trauma as a way of making sense of it and possibly healing it. But I wondered whether how you find the balance between that search for healing and perhaps continuing to be defined by it or making it harder to process that. And then also by talking about it, you maybe invite other people's unsolicited stories of trauma that maybe makes it easier, maybe makes it harder to heal. Mm, Yeah, this is such a good question. And um, the answer is I don't think I've found that balance yet. I think it's a really, really, really tricky one. Um, Writing about trauma is, as you say, it's very, very complicated in some ways. And I think for me, in in most ways, it's, it's very, very helpful because I have always felt safer reading and writing than I do speaking to people. I mean, you know, I, I, as a kid, I was always reading and I was always writing and I found that easier than socialising in a lot of ways. Um, so when I first realised that I might have to tell someone about my rape in order to better understand the kind of physical consequences it had left me with, I knew immediately that I couldn't do that by speaking it. Uh, because it's just, you know, naturally much, much harder for me. I knew that reading about it and then writing about it would be the kind of safest way for me to do that. Um, So in some ways, you know, writing about it is the thing that allowed me to speak about it and so is an incredibly powerful thing, I think, for that reason. And I know that a lot of the people who have contacted me feel the same way about reading and writing is that you can commune with writing in a way that doesn't expect anything from you you know if you tell if you tell if you talk about your trauma with another person if you're someone like me who's constantly worried about being a burden then you think that you're asking something from them um but when someone's reading something they don't have to respond immediately um and that's what I love about literature and that's what I love about writing so I think it's really, really helpful in that way. Of course, you know, as you say, it is also difficult um, when you do write about these things because it means that you end up having to think about them a lot. And I went from not thinking about it at all ever <laughs> to having to think about it all the time, which is ki- kind of aligns with my personality. Like I'm, I kind of don't do things by half. And so everyone around me was like, this makes sense to me. Like you tell no one forever and then you tell everyone all at once, you know. Um, But it is hard then having to talk about it all the time. And as you say, you know, sometimes feeling like I've become defined by it, which which is not what I want. But I do think in terms of processing it, I have come to the belief that, um, acceptance and looking at things really squarely is the best way to process them even if that is painful and it certainly has been for me at times there have been times when I just wish I could take it all back and not publish that first piece on the ABC and have none of this ever happen but in terms of actually processing things and healing both my mind and my body I think that uh looking squarely at it all the time uh has been the most helpful thing for me um which is not to say you know I also have strategies to to stop it from being on my mind all the time like I have an obsession at the moment with tech journalism I just like read long form articles about like 5g and stuff I don't know why but it makes me feel so calm (laughs) um so I always have things like that where I'll kind of go into a different world and not think about this stuff at all um and then the other part of your question which I think is really interesting Um, is this idea of um, other people talking to me about things that have happened to them. Um, I I think that there is definitely room for that to not be helpful. For for me, I actually really love it. Um, And I find it, you know, all of this process has been about kind of feeling less alone. Um, And when people write to me and say, reading your writing made me feel less alone because here's what happened to me. That also makes me feel less alone. 
you know, more more than, you know, it makes me feel um, re-traumatised or anything like that. You know, I, I find those messages really, really lovely. And, and I know that other people don't feel that way. And I know it can be really difficult for people. But um, my honest answer to that is that, you know, I really, it makes me feel like there's a community of people, sometimes people that I'll never be able to meet, you know, depending how long this pandemic goes on for, um, but who, you know, feel connected to me in some way. And the thing about shame that I talk about a lot in the book is that connection, like real connection, is the thing that kind of dispels it. So while there are so many difficulties with processing these things all the time, it's also a really good way to, to fight back against sh shame because talking about these things allows you to make connections with people that you wouldn't be able to make if you were just like talking about the weather. I say no. that as someone who's you know, been living in London for three years and I'm bored of everyone talking to me about the weather all the time. Uh, but you know, it, it, does, it does really help you connect with people and I love that about it. You know, it's, it's probably my favourite part about this whole thing. Well, you did solicit people's stories of trauma for this book. Like it wasn't just people coming in, like unloading on you. I'd love to know how you went about finding the stories and then how you chose who did and didn't get, get into the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this was a really interesting process. It started before the pandemic. So I was meeting people in person. Um, I was planning on travelling around. This was going to be a big travelling book. Um, but then obviously that didn't happen. So I'd met a few people in person before the pandemic happened. And how I did that was I just put a call out on Twitter and on Instagram and I said, um, I would love to speak to anyone about um, their relationship with their bodies and trauma. Um, anyone who wants to speak to me, um, I said, I'd love to speak to any, any women, trans or non-binary people. Um, and I just, uh, got so many responses you know so many people who who wanted to to speak to me and so yeah at first I went and I met people and I sat in their living rooms and I you know had a cup of tea with them and I talked to them about the things that they wanted to talk to me about um and then the pandemic happened and, and everything had to move online which was um at f which was tricky because speaking to someone on zoom about the worst thing that's ever happened to them is a weird thing to do um, and you know all these conversations went on for hours and weeks and months um, and so we, we got used to it um, but at first it, it is it is weird um, especially also because I'm very conscious that you know I am not a health professional I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist so having these conversations and then just ending the zoom call and knowing that that person will then just be on their own you know I found that really hard and I had lots of strategies where I would kind of say to people like you call me straight back if you close your laptop and, and are feeling you know unanchored um so I, I spoke to everyone who re reached out to me and and everyone who reached out to me is in the book in some form well a lot of people had the conversation with me and then decided they didn't want to be included but everyone who wanted to be included is in the book in some form um and so the people who were happy to have the kind of the details of their stories included, those are the people who, who became the backbone of the book. Um, and so, you know, it was really mostly their choice rather than mine. And then once I had them all, I just had to kind of figure out how to kind of allow them to speak to each other in the book, um, which was was the kind of biggest thing I wanted to do with this because these were all people who were speaking to me sometimes for the first time sometimes telling me these stories for the first time ever you know they hadn't told anyone apart from me um so all these people were feeling very very alone in their experiences and I wanted to find a way in the book to enable them to be having a conversation with each other even though you know that's so hard to do in real life um, when when you aren't able to speak about these things. Um, so yeah, once I had everyone and I knew who the people were who were happy to have the details of their stories in there, mostly anonymized, but who were happy to have the details in there, um, I then just kind of put them all, you know, wrote them all down and decided how I could structure the book around their stories. Um, so yeah, it was really, you know, it would have been 
I think if I had a bigger following, it would have been harder because I would have had more people, more people than I could incorporate in there. Um, so, but it it ended up being kind of the perfect amount of people really that that reached out to me and that I spoke to. Um, and so I yeah I decided to dedicate a chapter to each person and and then try and weave them in together somehow. I don't know if that answers the question very well. Yeah, it does definitely. And w- when I read the book, I mean, obviously you've done a lot of work to make this cohesive, but the the call out of sort of just asking people to tell you about their bodies and sh- and trauma or shame, those things, it it feels vague, and yet the answers really cluster quite strongly around certain themes that are so familiar, right? Like disordered eating, gender identity, sexual dysfunction, chronic illness. Like, did those themes were they immediately clear for you or did you have to work to sort of put them together? You know, it was the the biggest joy of writing this book was doing these interviews because these things became clear so quickly. Like it was amazing to me how much these people shared Um, and and not in the detail of their stories at all because, you know, I I really wanted to make sure that they were all different. Um, But, but, in the kind of impacts of those stories. Everyone had so much in common. Um, Firstly, in in the way they felt about themselves and the way they felt about what had happened, but also the habits that they were using to cope with those feelings. Um, And that struck me immediately. You know, I didn't ask a single person to talk to me about how they felt about food and controlling food or how they felt about body image, but it came out in every conversation and and it came out in every conversation as a consequence of something that had happened to them that had made them feel out of control. Um, And it's the same with um, drinking and addiction and drug abuse and all of these things. You know, I never asked anyone to tell me about that, but it just, it always was part of the story because when people sit down and have to tell a story from start to finish, they, they often start with the thing that happened and they'll tell me about the aftermath and the aftermath always has one of these elements in it. And so, all of these people shared these things. Um, And then I started doing research about shame. And what I found out in reading Bessel van der Kolk and Gabor Maté and kind of the the people who really, really understand this, um, and Brené Brown writes a lot about this as well, is that all, you know, you open these books about shame and they list these things. They list disordered eating, addiction, sexual dysfunction, chronic illness, chronic pain, migraines, lupus, you know, all these things that result from shame because they are a consequence of of having really unbearable feelings and needing a way to try and cope with those feelings. Um, And so it was just amazing to me that I did all the interviews first and then I wanted to do all this backup research and I would open these books and these people would just be describing exactly what had come out of my own reporting like you know you, I, it couldn't have aligned more clearly and I just found that so striking and also so frustrating because a lot of these things that we're talking about we are also shamed for so like disordered eating um addictive behaviors all these things are things that society kind of frowns upon so you know we have a bad thing happen we feel ashamed and we have all these feelings that we find it hard to cope with. We do these very human things that help us cope with those feelings. And then we're shamed again for the the things that we use to cope. Um, And I just, that makes me so mad, you know, that all these people I spoke to, taking disordered eating as an example, all these people I spoke to, every time they would try and get help and say, you know, I'm really unwell, um, I'm not eating properly, doctors would just say, stop being indulgent like stop being attention seeking this is such a scary you know that that idea of like you sort of call out that thing like attention seeking we say it like it's a bad thing I need attention like help if that just blew my yeah yeah and it's so ingrained that you know you know almost every week I still have this conversation with my therapist even about this book I say you know I'm so nervous about it coming out and I don't want to talk about it she says why and I say you know, because I think I'm being attention seeking, like deep in my core somewhere, I think I'm being attention seeking. And she's like, yeah, <laughs> like these things need attention. You should be, you should be drawing attention to them. And, you know, she's saying, I know that one part of you is proud of drawing attention to them, but there's this like little shame part that's been told again and again and again, 
that attention seeking is like a really it's like a moral failure so it's like a really really negative thing whereas like if your body is in crisis whether that's from addiction or disordered eating or chronic pain that, that comes from untreated trauma any of these things you know seeking attention is exactly what you should be doing you know um and that's the thing that will stop these symptoms from metastasizing and spreading is is seeking attention but but we're told not to do it and um you know i just almost all of the people i interviewed had been turned away at some point because of the way that we view these things that are often a consequence of trauma so it's just really hard because then it it doubly ingrains your inability to speak about the thing that happened to you because even the consequences of it are hard to talk about because you get dismissed by doctors and people around you and you know even even the consequences have shame and stigma attached to them um so yeah that just it you know it makes me so angry and that, that we kind of see these things as as really negative when it's when people are just coping the best that they can and also that if we if we didn't have so much stigma attached to sexual assault for example then no one would need those things because we would be able to get treatment for the feelings themselves you know the first we would be able to get treatment at the first instance and say you know why do I feel this self-loathing why do I feel ashamed all the time and then those secondary things wouldn't happen. I thought it was a really interesting point where you're talking about, yeah, like someone assaults you and you feel shame because of it. They've like transmitted that shame mm. to the victim who then is stigmatized for it. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I, like I was saying about earlier about kind of communing with other writing being, you know, a really helpful thing for me. Uh, Mira Atkinson's book Traumata is when I first encountered that idea and she said you know there is this shame transmission that happens and she says of her own abuser she says I was ashamed for him but it was not my shame and I think that's you know it was the such an aha moment for me that you know when an act of violence is committed or, or any anything that kind of um dehumanizes you um that kind of it kind of demands to be carried and the, the perpetrators of it will ne will always refuse to carry it, you know. Um, and so the, the victim is kind of forced to do that. And I think also because we as a society are so bad at looking squarely at epidemics of violence and and all of, all of the things on the spectrum of trauma that we just can't, <laughs> we can't cope with the fact that this happens all the time. And so we can't, you know attach any shame to the perpetrators and so we make the victims carry it because if we do that then then no one talks about it and we can all pretend it doesn't happen um you know and that is so beneficial to all the people who want to kind of pretend these things don't happen and have a nice life and it is so damaging to victims who then have all these kind of long-term impacts of not being able to speak about things it's funny you used the word dehumanizing then and one of the themes that really stood out to me in the in the book not just around the disordered eating and addictions but even the pain and all of those other things is this separation from our ability to listen into our bodies like the pain but then even listening to our hunger cues or listening to our sexual desires like women and non-binary folk muting themselves somehow blunting those like when mm -hmm that and how do we get that back well yeah exactly I mean it's such an interesting thing and you know this all comes back to uh dissociation and you know there it kind of just just to start with the kind of um physiological and scientific element of it I, I never understood this but but when you have anything traumatic which can be so many different things I mean this is the other thing about this book I you know I feel like we have these really um this idea of that trauma has to be something very, very, very bad or very dangerous in order to lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, which is absolutely not true. You know, it can be anything that causes us to feel a sense of danger, basically. That's the only criteria and that come, that our sense of danger depends on what we've lived through in our context. And so it can be all sorts of different things, but when your body feels that sense of danger and, and feels like it can't escape, um, the, the fight or flight, mechanism um one huge part of that is dissociation and so you kind of separate yourself um your your, your brain splits essentially and it 
separates yourself from your body. Um, and, and that is uh, in some ways a very useful thing. You know, it's the brain trying to protect us from something bad that's happening so that we don't experience it properly. But if that fight or flight mechanism becomes stuck, which happens, you know, if we can't get treatment um, and if we can't speak up about these things, then we can move into kind of chronic dissociation. And we don't know that we're doing it, but the brain is constantly being switched into this mode where it will separate us from ourselves, essentially. Um, and then that feeds into all different facets of life. So, you know, that is how we avoid hunger cues and how we are able to kind of starve ourselves. Um, it's how we completely ignore sexual desires and often ignore the feelings of when our own consent and our own boundaries are being violated. Um, because we're not switched, we're not in tune with, you know, what our body is saying. And again, you know, it comes from a very normal, you know, the, the brain, there's a good reason the brain does that. But when it becomes chronic, it can, you know, affect our whole lives. Um, and it's so hard because when we don't talk about these things, that means we don't understand what dissociation is, for example. I mean, I didn't know this until a few years ago. Um, and so we don't understand how much how many different parts of our lives it can affect. So if you are chronically dissociating, it's very hard, for example, to have an intimate relationship with someone because you are in different parts of your mind at different times. And so, you know, you can be unpredictable. Your reactions to things can be unpredictable. Sometimes you can be completely kind of cut off from yourself. Um, and when you don't know that that's what's happening, it's very hard to deal with it. And also, again, we are made to feel so much shame about it. So, you know, there's all these gendered ideas about women being emotionally volatile. Um, and the, that so often that comes down to having a kind of chronic dissociative disorder. And also just having, even if it doesn't, if it's not at that point, just having a normal response to trauma, you know. But it's been turned into these kind of gendered st stigmas about just black being a bit volatile. And so we kind of then hate ourselves more for that when in fact it's, it's so much easier when you see it as actually a very healthy response to something that has happened. Um, and yeah, so I, I mean, I read something the other day about how uh, trauma can eventually cause uh, what we used to call split personality disorder, which we now call um, dissociative disorder. Um, and, you know, that just, that just shows you how powerful that dissociative mechanism is. Um, and on a lower level that so many of us feel every single day, that is the thing that allows us to not be, not to, you know, ignore when we're hungry. Or the, I remember when I first, I was 21 or something, I did an internship at The Guardian and we used to sit there every day and I didn't take lunch because I thought that they would think I was like not committed or something. Yeah. And, oh, you know, adults around me were like, how, how do you do that? And I'm like, I just switch it up. Like I just, I really do. And, um, because I didn't know much about any of these things at the time. I look back now and I, I spent that whole month just completely apart from myself, you know. Um, so yeah, the, the process of healing trauma is so much about trying to tune into those things again and trying to say, um, you know, I'm in pain and therefore I'm not going to, I can't work today. You know, and I used to never, I would just push myself and push myself and push myself because I thought if I just separated myself from the pain that I could continue to be a normal person. But it doesn't work like that. There's always a consequence, you know. So now if I'm in pain, I say, I'm in pain and I need to stay in bed and, and I need to listen to that. Um, so, and it's the same with, you know, eating and things. It's just saying like, I'm hungry. That means I need some food, you know. And that's a really interesting process of trying to become present and, and tune into those things again. It feels so basic, like you shouldn't have to learn how to do that, but here we are. And, of course, um, for all of you guys who are listening and watching, if you have a question, we're gonna, we have allowed some time for questions at the end. So pop them in the chat. Um, we'll get to them in a second. Uh, so one of the big things I really like kind of the, where the book finishes is this idea of, trauma as a driver, one driver of chronic pain and chronic disease. And you've got quite a few eminent voices in the book talking about how there's a link here, but there's a whole lot of medicine that really doesn't seem to recognize this link. Do you think that there is a shifting awareness and like how far, how far, how much further do we have to go to get there? 
Yeah, I think there's definitely a shifting awareness. There's there's also a thing that I like to think and say about this book, which is that, you know, especially because I'm not a scientist and I know that that science, you know, is that there has to be a certain level of kind of short surety before you can kind of say this definitely causes this. Um, so, you know, I don't want to be saying this is definitely what what, you know, how trauma works and how it affects the body and in 10 years we'll know that for sure it's just that like you know here is here is an idea that a lot of people now think has you know has legs and it's worth thinking about you know it's worth thinking is this possible is this possible for me could this explain and with as with anything in medicine you know there's so much going on and everything is multifactorial so it's never going to be this one thing led to this thing but I think it's really useful to just say, could this be part of my story? You know, could this be part of what is what the constellation of my life looks like, and and what would that mean if it was? So, I. But you know, so basically, that is to say, you know, I don't, I don't think this any of this stuff is certain, but I think that's okay, um, and I think it's kind of important to talk about it anyway. Um, but I do think the awareness is shifting. The more and more and more. I speak to when I speak to doctors um, they will express this in some way so a few years ago when I started kind of being aware of these things sometimes I would bring it up with GPs for example and they would look at me like I was insane um, and now that never happens and it's it's brought up with me all the time whenever I talk about Crohn's disease whenever I talk about chronic pain a doctor will say something about physical trauma or emotional trauma so it definitely in my experience it definitely seems to be shifting and I think the good thing about that is that we will slowly get more and more research so you know we just don't have enough you know in science you just you really need a huge amount of literature to, to definitively prove something and that work hasn't been done yet but I feel like it will be more and more um, and we'll have a kind of bigger body of evidence to to look at this and assess it and see how it works you know because when I speak to doctors about this they say what we know is that people who have been traumatized uh, more often than not will develop an autoimmune condition for example we have no idea why for some people it's lupus and for some people it's MS and for some people it's chronic migraine you know that we don't know. We don't know why it, it manifests differently in different people. The kind of underlying autoimmune problem, which is caused by the fight or flight response, getting stuck and being in having a kind of chronic fight or flight response means that your nervous system stops being able to regulate itself. And when your nervous system stops being able to regulate itself, uh, the immune system can break down. But, you know, we don't know why for some people it's chronic abdominal pain and for some people it's headaches. Um, so that's a really interesting thing that, you know, a lot of the doctors I've spoken to say, you know, we're working on it and hopefully we will figure it out. Um, and it's the same with um, endometriosis specialists. I do a lot of reporting on endometriosis and a lot of doctors say to me, you know, off the record, like I, I'm going to have, I have a trial coming out that, that looks at exactly how, what the connection is between the actual disease tissue that, that we call endometriosis and then the pain response that is linked to that disease tissue which is different for everyone so some people have no pain response to endometriomas in their body and some people have overactive pain responses so it's a really complicated thing and they they now think that the pain response is actually an autoimmune problem so again you know there's so much going on and so much of it has to do with that fight, fight or flight mechanism so i'm really excited for there to be more evidence coming out and more research. And I've spoken to so many people who are kind of starting to do it now, which means it will come out in five years or something. And hopefully we'll have a better understanding of how all these things work. Yeah, it might not help us, but it hopefully helps the next generation. So, I mean, exactly. women are chronically underrepresented in medical research and our stories are, cis women's stories are increasingly being heard, but you made a real effort to include stories of non-binary folk in this book. and. I wonder if there were like particular themes of what they told you that really sang out. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, I mean, everyone I spoke to who was processing their gender identity in one way or another um, had 
you know, similar themes, but expressed in a different way. So they were all being shamed by medical professionals, sometimes by their families, a lot of times by their friends. Um, so shame was a huge part of it. Um, and also they were being gaslighted. I never know whether the past tense of that is gaslighted or gaslit, but, you know, they were being told by everyone around them that their own experience wasn't real or wasn't valid or that they were somehow mistaken, you know, um, and that that chimes in a lot of ways with the, with the way that the medical profession dismisses um, women's issues, but it is also very different. And I think in a lot of ways, even more, you know, oppressive and, and awful because it's people saying, here is what I understand about myself and other people looking at them and saying, you're wrong about that. Um, and, and you just don't, you just don't understand yourself or your own life. Um, and, and that really, you know, that is so destructive to a person. And it is so hard, as all the non-binary people said to me in this book, it is so hard to overcome that, you know, to, to be able to say, yes, I'm real. You know, the, the way that I want to live my life is real and the feelings I have about my body are real. And um, that everyone I spoke to found that so, so difficult just because everyone around them was so determined to tell them the opposite. And that is, I think, because people are afraid and they don't understand and they'd much rather kind of shut someone down than actually listen and try and understand. And the flip side of that is also true in that in everyone's stories, every non-binary person I spoke to, their story changed when someone was able to listen to them and believe them and say, I'm not going to inject myself into your narrative. I'm just going to listen to you. Um, and how you feel about your body and how you feel about your gender identity. And so it comes back to this same thing about shame and connection, you know, shame only survives when we can't connect with people and when people don't listen to us and people don't believe us. And all of these people, you know, the reason they were able to speak to me was that they had had a turning point where someone in their lives had been willing to show up and just listen. Um, and I thought that was, you know, really, really powerful. And as soon as someone had done that for them, it's like, you know, it's like making tiny little cracks in a big wall of shame. And then eventually you, you are able to say to other people, you know, no, I am real. My experience is real. And I don't actually care if you believe me or not, because I have other people who do. We're going to go to questions in just a second. So if you've got them, pop them in the chat. Lucia, I have two daughters. And so like, this felt really real and immediate to me because not only am I seeing the world that I live in and my experience is reflected in your writing, but also this fear or this wanting to protect this next generation. And it struck me, you were sort of just saying it then as well, this you can't really control what other people do to you. But shame, if shame is the is the kind of key thing, it's this, this feel, you, you write that abuse only works if we're led to feel unsure about what we deserve. And I wonder how we can protect the next generation. Obviously people should stop abusing people. That would be a great start, but yeah. what else we can do to self-empower or empower the other women and non-binary people around us so that we don't walk around carrying this silently for years. Like you felt like yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I think you're right. I think it's such a, an important point is that, you know, it would be so great if this stuff stopped happening. But, you know, as, as one of the things in life that is so hard to learn but so great when you're able to accept it is that you can't control everything and you can't control what happens to you or the people that you love. You know, I wish we could, um, but we can't. And the things we can control are how we respond to what has happened and and how and whether we open up about it. And I think the step that comes before that um, is we can control whether or not we show up for the people around us as well. So, you know, even before we are able to say, okay, this bad thing happened, I'm going to not be silent about it, I'm gonna talk about it. Even before that is kind of waking up every day and, and, and showing up for people that we love and, and being incredibly open to having hard conversations. And, you know, picking up on things and, and saying, like, is there anything you want to talk to me about? And just creating space for that. Because the more we do it for others, the more able we feel to do it for ourselves. And the more we create those connections in our lives where it's safe to talk about those things. 
So, you know, that's something I would love to see more of, especially with, in terms of our relationships with younger people, is to be able to be really, really open about letting people speak about things and, and not, not expressing our own discomfort and not looking away and being able to kind of be a compassionate witness to the people around us. Because I really do think that develops our capacity to be a compassionate witness for ourselves. Because, you know, you hear it so often, you know, the way you talk to yourself, you would never talk to your best friend that way. And, you know, if you're sitting with someone and you're saying to them, like, this is not your fault, I'm looking at you and I love you and this is not your fault, it, it, it works that muscle, you know, and eventually you get better at saying it to yourself. And then that allows you to kind of speak up when bad things do happen. And I think that's kind of the kind of um, working on that muscle part is important because it's not every day that we need to speak up about something, but it is every day that we can kind of show up for other people and, and be someone who is open to that and, so, you know, be the person that someone knows will kind of be okay if they want to say something that's difficult to hear. Um, and this goes for everything, you know, friendships and also I speak to doctors a lot and in my reporting and when I'm talking about this book and I, I was speaking to a group of medical students recently and one of them said to me, and I thought, I've never thought about this before, but I've experienced it so much in my life and I thought it was so interesting. He said to me, we at medical school are taught about certain screening questions that are uncomfortable for people and we have to say before we ask them, this is, this is just a screening question, or this is just, I have to ask this, or some version of that, which we've all heard. And then they say it's things like, have you ever considered suicide? Things like that. And they say before, like, I have to ask this to everyone. And, you know, I know that comes from the right place, but what it says to the patient is, I'd rather you not talk about this. You know, it says, I, I have to ask this, but like, it just puts distance between you. And, and, you know, the, the, the young doctor, trainee doctor who brought this up with me, he was 24 and he said, you know, I'm uncomfortable saying that to people. You know, and he said, it happens a lot with when he's talking about people's sex lives. And he says like, oh, I have to ask this, but like, have you ever done this or whatever? And he's like, it immediately primes the people to think it's an uncomfortable question rather than it just being like a very normal question about a person's body and a person's health that is, shouldn't be stigmatized. And he said, you know, that adds stigma. And I think that's a great like institutional example of that kind of taking away those barriers when you're trying to connect with people. Because if you say as a doctor, you know, I have to ask this, then that, that person is less likely to tell you the truth. And then that starts the ball rolling of the kind of secrecy and the shame. So let's take some questions. We'll start with an easy one. Um, someone's asking, what page of the book did you read from at the beginning? Oh, great. That is an easy one. Um, well, it would be easy if I had uh, <laughs> if I had noted it down. Oh, no, page 19, the top of page 19 is where I went from. Okay, so there you go. That was an easy one. Thank you, Tegan, and thank you to, to the question asker. Pivoting to Rebecca asking, did people talk with you about how they were healing their bodies from trauma and shame when they were telling you their stories? Yeah, absolutely. And I really, really loved this part. I mean, not everyone. And I, and I didn't want to make the call out seem like you have to be over, you know, you have to be fully recovered in order to talk to me. So, if, so what, you know, for some people, they were like, I am right in the middle of this. Um, but there are a lot of people who, who talk to me about how they kind of started the process of coming out the other side. And I really, really loved that because it's so different for different people. So because of, because I put these call outs on my Twitter and things, a lot of the people that spoke to me were writers or aspiring writers. So a lot of people said I started reading books again and I started getting out of the part of my head that just wanted to distract myself all the time. And, you know, I would just sit down and I would say, I'm not going to do anything until I've read X many chapters of this book, you know, how, depending on um, how fast you read and things like that. But it would just be like, I, it's, you know, it's like a therapy session when you, the, the useful thing about those is that you can't do anything else for that time. You, you know, you're just in the moment and everyone had different versions of that. So for a lot of people, it was reading for a lot of people, it was listening to audiobooks. So just kind of resting the body, lying down really still and listening to a novel or something and, and counteracting that part of our brain that says, you know, you're not ever allowed to do nothing. Like you have to be hustling all the time. And um, listening to books was like a really great way for people to kind of take a breath and tell their body that it was okay to rest. 
Um, and then for other people, um, it was quitting alcohol, for example. Like I spoke to a couple of people who said, the day that I realised it was possible for me to stop drinking for a while, you know, not forever, not saying I'll never touch this again, but having a, a week or a few weeks or a few months off and kind of forcing yourself to be a bit present with how you're feeling. Um, people found that really helpful. Um, a lot of people uh, found relationships with animals really, really helpful. Um, I've actually, I've just done some reporting on this for the ABC, which will come out sometime this week, is that um, relationships with animals can be very, very healing, especially when you when you don't feel quite ready to connect with other people or to speak about, you know, kind of what you're feeling. Um, so the thing I loved about talking to people is that everyone had a different version of, of what worked for them to kind of start the healing process. And also the thing that strikes me is that it's so hard to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to get better now. You know, it's such a huge thing, but all you need is to stumble across the thing that helps, the thing that kind of makes things stop spinning for a minute and that makes you feel kind of grounded. And as soon as you stumble across it, you just have to do a little bit of it. And the more you do it, the more you believe in your ability to, to kind of keep going. You know, it should never be this huge thing where you're like, now I'm going to deal with my trauma all at once, you know, and I'm going to, because that's very overwhelming. Um, but it's just about, I think, and for all the people I spoke to, it's about trying things, trying new things, trying different things that you enjoy. And, and you just find that one thing that makes it feel possible. And, you know, that's how I always express it to myself. And for me, it's, it's books, you know, I sit down and you read a certain passage and you're like, oh, OK, this is what it feels like to feel calm. This is what it feels like to actually not be afraid or panicking. or, And then you get more and more of those moments and they're so cumulative and they build up to kind of uh, an ability to heal, I think. But Claudia asking or making the point that society seems to really struggle with people's trauma and is often quick to dismiss it, which then compounds those feelings of shame and isolation, like you said, and is sort of reflecting that how can we at an individual level and a community level start to teach society that it's okay to listen to trauma and what to do when someone does open up about their experience? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and I think it's a really, really, really important one. Um, I think you're absolutely right. We, we hate talking about this kind of thing. And I don't know what it is about the human brain, but we really don't like it. And people will do whatever they can to avoid having these kinds of conversations. Um, and so I think it's really hard. I think uh, a lot of, I think there's a lot of things we can do um, when people are very young and in schools and things like that to be able to kind of encourage kids to talk about difficult things. I think we do a lot of trying to get kids not to, not to do that um, in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, but then also in our institutions now, I think, you know, workplaces can do it. You know, all it takes is to kind of have a meeting and, and say to people, you know, if you are, if you can't come to work, not because like, you know, like you don't have to pretend to have a tummy bug or something, but like if you are having a depressive episode or you feel awful or, and, you know, you're, having, you're struggling with your mental health, like just tell me that, you know, like that is a valid reason to take a day off work. Even things like, you know, it sounds so kind of obvious, but when when people do it, it makes a really, really big difference. And so I think in all of our kind of levels of community, um, we can do more and our leaders can do more. You know, it's the same with politicians. Like politicians can do more to, to be able to, to encourage people to speak about this kind of thing. Um, and then on an individual level, I think we can all, you know, there are little things we can do to our, with our friends and family that signal that we are open to having those conversations, whether that is kind of asking a question and saying like, how are you actually doing at the moment? Or kind of asking, asking the follow-up questions that people really try and avoid. So, so often um, what we naturally do is we'll say something to indicate that something's wrong. Um, and we will leave that space open and a person will just change the subject. It's our natural inclination because I don't know why. Um, but to just, you know, we can all think about when we do that and just like take a moment, acknowledge the urge to change the subject and then ask a follow-up question and, you know, see what that person actually wants to say. And, you know, this, I think about this a lot with doctors as well, you know, there are so many times that people will go to a doctor or a GP, especially because it's most people's kind of first 
port of call and someone will say something that indicates that there's a problem. And usually it's a few steps removed from the actual problem. Um, and it just takes a couple more questions to, to get to the heart of it. But a lot of GPs don't want to do that. And they'll just find a way to end the appointment or find a way to kind of only deal with the superficial problem that the person has come to them with. They're one of my favourite um, books in the world is The Empathy Exams by Leslie Jameson. And the title of that book comes from the fact that when Leslie was um, in grad school for writing, she worked as a medical actor in order to support herself, which means that she has to go in with uh, medical students and pretend to be a patient. And she marks them on whether they figure out what's wrong with her or not. And so the script that she gets literally says at the top, you know, you are having seizures because you can't process the death of your brother. And then it says what she actually tells the doctor. And there are these little cues that are supposed to get them to ask the right question to find out that she needs to process grief and that she needs, you know, she needs a grief counsellor. She doesn't necessarily need medication for seizures, you know. And most medical students and therefore, you know, down the line, most doctors will do whatever they can not to ask those questions. So I think both on, a, on an institutional level and on a personal level, just kind of being able to say things and ask questions that indicate to someone that, that you're up for it, you know, that you're not afraid to talk to them about difficult things. I've heard good GPs say that the question that people ask is the one that they say when their hand's on the door handle on the way out. They'll sort of turn around and be like, by the way, blah. And that's Absolutely. Issue. But that happens yeah. in our personal lives as well. Um, got Ruben asking about a theory from a different book that um, most male violence stems from shame and emasculation and was wondering if you'd encountered this theory in your research. Yeah, great question. Um, so... That is not something that I deal with in this book only because, you know, I think it's it's a bit, we already kind of struggled with being like, oh, there's too much in this book. And so we didn't want to incorporate um, male shame in this, partly because um, I think it needs to be a different book and partly because, you know, because I don't have personal experience of it, I didn't want to kind of speak as though I knew about it and I didn't. And, you know, the more I read about it, the more I realise that I don't understand it and the more I realise how much learning I have to do about male shame. You know, it's hugely important and you're absolutely right, it plays an enormous role in, in violence. Um, and so often people, uh, because of the way that sh shame is enacted in on men and the way that it's kind of put on men, violence is so often an expression of feeling ashamed. Um, and I think, you know, I think there really needs to be loads and loads and loads of books written about that. I um, think, you know, if we were able to talk more, as we've been saying with all these other kinds of shame, if we were able to talk more about male shame, we would really, you know, go a long way in, in kind of helping ourselves and each other heal from trauma because we know that so many instances of violence when you really look at someone they have a traumatic history they have something in their past that they're struggling to cope with and violence is is one of those habits that we were talking about before you know it's one of those ways that we kind of get out of the feeling of of being ashamed it's one of the ways we numb the feeling um you know if society has primed us for violence which it which it does more for men than women um and I actually um a friend of mine has written a whole book about uh, male shame, which is coming out next year. And he got me in to do a chapter with him that was about gender stuff that he couldn't express. So he's, he was saying, you know, this, uh, you know, the, the female perspective is missing from this book. So would you come in and talk to me about this? Um, but what was great is that I got to read the rest of the book. And there was, you know, I learned so much about male shame. And I actually, you know, I texted a, a couple of men that I had been close to and you know one ex-boyfriend in particular and I said you know I'm really sorry like I I didn't I didn't get it like I really didn't I didn't understand how these things that I talk about all the time were playing out in your life as well in a very different way but you know the the patterns are the same so um I'm so grateful that you asked that question because I think it's really important I think all the kind of really damaging parts of it are the same and it's enacted in different ways so often you know we don't recognize it as the same pattern but it is there and I would really like to learn more about it.
Well, that's all we've got time for tonight, Lucia. Thank you so much for sharing so openly. Thank to everyone for your time and for your questions. Uh, I do definitely recommend you purchase this book. The link to how to, to, how to purchase it is in the chat uh, at the Avid Reader website. Uh, support small businesses. Here's Chrissy. Yes. Hey, look, that was absolutely fascinating. I was listening with um, bated breath over there at the other computer. Um, Tegan, thank you so much. That was amazing. This is Tegan's <laughs> thumbs up. And yeah. thank you Lucia, as well. I'm so sorry that we couldn't host you in person, but maybe there'll be a time in um, the future where you come to Australia and to Brisbane again. And, well, I'm sure there will be. Let's cross fingers. I certainly, I certainly hope so. I would love to be back there. And thank you for hosting me anyway, even though we couldn't, you know, do it as we wanted to. I really appreciate you hosting me online. So thank you for having me. And, Tegan, thank you for that wonderful discussion. And thank you, for everyone who's watching and listening, and thank you for all your brilliant questions. It was wonderful. I do encourage everybody to purchase that book and have a read of it. It will only take you a night, as, <laughs> as Tegan says. It's a ripper. Um, so thank you very much for writing it. We will um, see you all later. So see you guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.